Hello and welcome on today's show. Brad and I discuss our reading list for 2019. We talk about negotiating from a position of strength, career hacking, how to move from one sector to another and what's hot right now, and what we would do differently if we were re-recording episode one today. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, super excited to dive into this past week's episode and talk about our takeaways with Mr. Refined by Fire. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, what's going on by you? Well, one of the things that I've actually been doing recently is aggregating my planned out reading list for 2019. So I had several books that I just thoroughly enjoyed last year, and I'm trying to keep this trend going. And in fact, I guess this is kind of like a, a two-part answer. My wife has been encouraging me to take a no technology day. What if there was a single day a week that you could just shut off everything, be totally incommunicado from a Wi-Fi perspective and just focus on, you know, time with our family or spending time just catching up on reading. And I have a backlog. And so last year, one of the probably the best books I read was Mindset by Carol Dweck. This year, I have three that I'm tackling. The one that I'm working on right now is Atomic Habits by James Clear. And then queued up right behind that, I have Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. I think that is, he has a newer book out now, but this is the one that I wanted to focus on just because it's relevant to things that I'm struggling with. And then a third book that I have teed up is actually a book called TED Talks, which was recommended to me by Kelly, who I met at Chautauqua. And one of the things that's so impressive about it and that I'm excited to, to read more about is this idea that with TED Talks, you're taking conversations that like in most settings would be academia or somewhat mundane, and you're tying incredibly compelling story to them. And as we talk about on this show, story drives everything. So I don't know, that's my, I, I, this is my reading list for 2019, and hopefully I'll read more than three books, but in my short queue, Atomic Habits, Deep Work, and TED Talks. And, and the reason I say all that is I wanted to throw it back to you. Because I was wondering, although I'm sure you have a list that you're teeing up for this year, if you were to look back at the last, you know, six to 12 months, what have been the three books that have had the biggest impact on your life? Wow, that's a really good question. Actually, first, I wanted to quickly mention what's interesting. It, it's cool to see these little connections with the financial independence world. So Cal Newport, I don't know if you've heard, Jonathan, but he's been on Brandon, the Mad Scientist and Paula from Afford Anything on their podcast recently. And it winds up he's like, a real member of the Fi community. Like he is intimately aware. And I think in his new book, Digital Minimalism, he highlights both Pete from Mr. Money Mustache and Liz and Nate from Frugal Woods, which oh. is really, really cool. Well, I haven't read his new book, but now I guess I'll have two of his books on my queue. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, what, wait, what, real quick, what is his new book called? So yeah, it's called Digital Minimalism. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's tied Which to what I'm working on as well. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. And I've got another one for you, not only tied in exactly, but another link to the Fi community. So there's a book called Make Time, How to Focus on What Matters Every Day. One of the authors is named John Zaratsky. He called it his thank you notes. It's basically like acknowledgments at the end. And in it, he thanked his some of his favorite writers, and they included J.D. Roth, Pete from Mr. Money Mustache, and Paula Pan. I actually messaged with Paula last night. I'm like, oh, have you read Make Time yet? I'm sure you have your mention in the back. And she was like, what, what, what? Like, this is awesome, you know? <laughs> so she was really pleasantly surprised. So yeah, a couple really good books in just in that whole sphere of cutting out this digital distraction. You know, it's so easy to get truly addicted. And I mean, I don't use that word lightly, but addicted. And just being conscious of it, I think, allows you to create that space to kind of just pause and not unlock the phone mindlessly. And, you know, in fairness, I have not read Digital Minimalism yet. I am actually on the wait list at the library, but I have read Make Time and it's it's phenomenal. 
It's very interesting talking about that idea of digital minimalism, just because if you think about when we were growing up, so we're kind of this transitional generation where, you know, we can probably both recollect when there were rotary phones. And now like our kids have no idea what that even means, what it, what it even looks like, but we kind of have experienced both sides. We're both users and really, you know, high level users of, of technology. But at the same point, we remember the chalkboards and that's to be differentiated from maybe like our parents or boomers who still have had access to both of those. But they're a little bit more wary. The learning curve has been a little bit slower. They kind of look at them still with distrust. Our generation kind of just totally embraces these, but we still have those memories, those faint memories from before. What's interesting about that is as we were growing up, we kind of knew we had this sense, this, this understanding that we needed to learn this technology as quickly as possible. We kind of remember when they were getting rid of all the old analog systems and replacing everything with digital and encouraging us to have our kids working on this stuff as quickly as possible. And it's weird that now, 2019, 2020, 2020 and beyond, you're kind of seeing this reversal where now the titans of industry, Silicon Valley, the tech giants, they're actually sheltering their kids from the same technology that our generation completely embraced. So they actually have schools where they have no technology, like it's just chalkboards. The kids have access to no screens. In fact, you pay a premium, an insane premium to be able to protect that environment. And it, it's interesting for me just to be intellectually honest to know that I, I too am kind of sheltering my son from some, like he doesn't have regular access to an iPad. It's not to say that we never watch TV, or, but he's never watching it alone, unsupervised, that sort of thing. And it's in very moderated, limited time. We don't let the iPad be the babysitter. But at the same time, the same guardrails that I put up for him, I don't totally put up for myself. And, and I think you just think about what are people struggling with? One of the biggest things is I have no time. A lot of time, that's really a limiting belief. You're not being intellectually honest because maybe what if you did have time, you just don't have time to watch six hours of your favorite shows reruns, you know, again and again and again. What if in reality, your time is just slowly slipping away from you just on outside of the radar under the banner of decompression? Yeah. And it's piece by piece, Jonathan, you know, this very intimately with Facebook messages, right? And emails and texts. How many Facebook messages do we pass back and forth in a day with the admins of our Facebook group or our team for choose a pie? Like, I mean, every single time you do that, it's 10, 15 minutes of attention that is just blinked off the face of the earth. And instead of creating, like you said, Cal Newport's deep work, instead of creating these massive time blocks where you can actually dive into something, we're getting these tiny little, almost like, I don't know, little rewards, right? These little pellets of information. And and it does, it sucks up a whole day sometimes. So yeah, and to your point about, about technology with kids, I mean, it's not about being a Luddite and, and not being interested in technology, but, but being wary of how it sucks them in. And I know our suburban county, Henrico County, right outside of Richmond, was always very, very proud. I think they were the first county in America, or at least they say, that required laptops for every student, I think middle school and above. And, and I look at that now and I wonder, like, do I really want my kids to be staring at a screen all day long? What is that going to do to their brains? So anyway, long story short, I know uh, you actually asked me a question of my favorite books this past year, and I, I didn't get around to answering it. So I've got a fascinating autobiography. It was actually by Andre Agassi. It's called Open. It really truly was open. I mean, he laid bare just his soul there. And it was it was one of the most interesting autobiographies I've ever read. I had heard about it on the Tim Ferriss podcast and I'd always been in a, a tennis fan and Agassi fan, but man, to see his life and what this guy grew up with. And interestingly enough, Jonathan, how little he actually liked tennis, genuinely hated tennis. It, oh. It's wild. I mean, really wild. And a lot of it had to do with his upbringing and his father. So that was kind of interesting. I read a book called Factfulness. It's 10 reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. It just gave me hope for the world. I think we hear a lot of doom and gloom. This book laid the case fairly convincingly that things are dramatically better than they've ever been in terms of education and health and access to medicine and all these things that like, we look at these broad swaths of the third world, quote unquote. And we think that a lot of us, sadly, who don't know anything, just think, that things are terrible. But the argument in this book was that the world is getting better year by year, decade by decade. And it, it did give me a lot of hope. And the final book, I would say, a uh, more serious book was 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. And 
that one I just finished. I haven't had enough time to internalize it. I, I really actually need to go back through it and read it again, but a uh, very impactful book. And then just kind of a uh, fun thing. I have been reading so many serious books recently and actually a friend of ours, uh, Steven, who was actually on our vegan path to fi episode 90. He and I are both into science fiction and fantasy books. And he recommended a series called Mistborn by uh, Brandon Sanderson. And I've just been devouring these things. So I'm about through the second 500 page book that I've read in the last week. So good stuff all around. Oh, awesome, man. I'm glad you threw a little curveball in there. And, you know, I'm actually a huge fan of audiobooks. And as it gets a little bit warmer, as I go on some of these extended walk slash dog slash occasionally a run, you know, occasionally, I like to usually throw an audiobook in the background. And I know at least the Mistborn series, that one I know is available in audiobook. And I would imagine these days in 2019, pretty much anything that you enjoy physically reading, you could probably pull up on a uh, audiobook as well. Oh, Jonathan, you just reminded me of another one, maybe my favorite book. This is why you sandbagging me with ideas. I, it's hard to remember all the books I've read. So Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Get the audiobook for everybody out there. Man, if you want to talk about upgrading your mindset, this is the book. I don't even want to ruin it or give any more info. Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Okay, fine. Episode over. That's the call to action today. Just go <laughs> yeah, do really. that this week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please shut off this podcast and listen to that. All right, well, let's go and take a few minutes and talk about this past week's episode with Refined by Fire. And the title is My Biggest Takeaway, Everything's Negotiable. While I think probably in his case, the student loan thing's a little bit of an outlier and that's not something that's gonna be replicable for the vast majority of the people that heard this, there was so much in the medical debt section that I think we can spend time on. And I think there's actually threads to connect that to other facets of our life as well. So with the medical debt, the sticker price, what you get on that bill in many cases is not the true price. It's like a starting point. It's almost understood that in his case, he was paying cash out of pocket. He didn't have insurance. I was in a similar situation when we had a health share. And so the hospital or provider gave me this bill. And what you need to understand is that whenever they come up with this price, that's rarely what they're being compensated. Even if, even if an individual has insurance, the provider is not going to get that that actual, you know, cost for the service. So let's say the cost was $1,000. They send that to the insurance. There is less than a 0% chance that the insurance is going to reimburse them at that full amount. It just doesn't work that way. It's a percentage of, and knowing that means that you have that same ability, maybe even more so in some cases as an individual to negotiate a lower rate. But you have to know that that is a possibility. I mean, obviously the easiest, the path of least resistance is just to get the bill and then swipe their credit card. And okay, now you owe the credit card and now that's there for you know ongoing, hopefully not for perpetuity. But if you slow down on that and you know that there's some margin between the sticker billing price and what you will actually have to pay, there's some room for some serious savings. Yeah, I agree. I think this was the big takeaway, this section of the episode on Monday. Everything is negotiable. It starts with having an understanding of how the game works. So if you have some sense that, Oh, if I had insurance, there's all of a sudden this magical, quote, negotiated discount. That's really nothing. It's just an adjustment. You even see it on the, the EOB. It's insurance adjustment. And how it often, doesn't mean, how often right? are you like, wow, I cannot believe my insurance paid them $400. Yeah. No, they yeah. didn't. <laughs> no, they paid them nothing. It's just, it's because of the contract they have, because they know these rack rates are just so absurdly inflated. So knowing the rules of the game is a huge one, right? I mean, something as simple, I, I feel like a lot of people might've heard this and, and not really understood how important this was, but he said, starting a conversation with a smile and some happy small talk and creating that connection. I have found personally in my own life, if, if you would ask me when I was this type a personality, like 20 years ago, like, oh, is that going to make a difference? I would have kind of chuckled and said, oh yeah, I doubt it very much. But like the me of today knows this type of connection, it just matters. It's hard to quantify, but man, when you do, when you put on a smile, when you're a nice person, when you're pleasant, when you actually care, when you say thank you, these are things I do all the time now in my interactions with people, both in person and on these type of calls. And wouldn't you guess, all of a sudden I have this amazing luck with people, quote unquote luck. And I use that tongue in cheek, but that's the way it works. You're creating your own luck. You're creating good experiences in your life just by being a nice person. Think about the person on the other side of that phone call. 
that's what you always have to do in life. You have to look both at their incentives, which Refined by Fire said, but you have to also look at what are they going through in a, in a day? They're getting a couple hundred phone calls and 99% of them are negative and they're just having to deal with people kind of yelling at them all day. And in the sea of that negativity, you get this one or two people who are just exceptionally nice to you, right? If you were that customer service representative, who are you going to go out of your way to help? It's obvious, Jonathan. It's obvious. Yes. And with a lot of these types of conversations, this is not a single transaction. This is a relationship. Even if it's just a relationship that's spread over three or four phone calls, it's not a one-off. You can't afford to mic drop every conversation. You may get the last word on that call before you, you know, throw that receiver down, but that receiver down doesn't even translate in 2019, does it? <laughs> it's really hard to like press the end button with any emotion. End. <laughs> Do you know, can you sense how angry I am right now? End call. <laughs> <laughs> but, but honestly, you know, you are going to want to follow up and you're going to be talking to someone else the next time you're going to say, Hey, Emily, my name's Jonathan. I had this conversation with John earlier today and we talked about this, you know, in order for Emily to then take that next step and help you with this next thing, there's probably going to need to be some communication with the first individual that you interacted with. If you are a jerk, it's going to lean, it's going to influence what every interaction looks like from there on out. So, I mean, just selfishly be a nicer person, selfishly be a nicer person. Yeah. And take detailed notes. I think that's kind of what you're alluding mm -hmm. to there is you're having these follow-ups, right? You're having multiple conversations, take notes and be able to use almost that, that name drop or that information drop. And it's going to be very obvious that you're an intelligent person and you're prepared and you're resourceful. Most people are not that at all. They're calling up and they're complaining and they just want to get it off their chest. And that's that. Unfortunately, this customer service representative has to bear the brunt of that. But if you show up and you're nice, you're pleasant and you're prepared, that's just fantastic. I, we have to stop on that because that is the biggest part of this. Your, your actual outlook, how you're interacting with people, but then your preparedness and more and specifically taking notes. Now, just to highlight this, when you're talking to an individual and you're talking out of a good place, and you're friendly, and you can point that you already had a conversation, not just with someone in a potentially different call center in a different area of the country, whatever, but with a specific name and a date that you had that conversation. Now you're following up with this individual. Let's say you have to get on a third phone call. And now you're not just saying like a hypothetical, you have two names that you've dropped. And on top of that, you're being nice. Now this is, this is really where it's important. This second or third individual that you're, that you're talking to, they know they can't just kind of oh, well, they'll figure it out. Let me transfer them to somebody else. Like they know just by virtue of the fact that you said, well, I've already done this and I talked to this person and I've already spoken to them and they told me I would do this. They know that they need to be the one to solve this for you. If you just assume that you're starting from scratch every single time and you don't have that, that documentation, those points of contact, there's a chance, even if you're nice, there's a chance that that person is going to assume they're going to let the next person be the one to handle this because this is going to take a little bit more time or attention. So it's both of those components. It's a documentation and then it is absolutely your attitude. And I, you know, one is, is good, but it's really important to have both of those. If this is going to be something that's going to take, you know, additional eyes. So I'm just glad you mentioned that. And I wanted to reiterate every single time that I've tackled a difficult negotiation type conversation, both of those factors have been in place when I got a successful outcome. Yeah. And I mean, just something as simple as people like it when you remember their name. I know that sounds silly, but just remembering someone's name in life, it goes a long way. So I've even found this in my own interactions, it just in person, right? So my daughters joined this big swim team recently. We have a lot of meets and I'm, I'm just getting introduced to a lot of parents. And I actually make a real significant effort to remember their names and to say their name the next time I talk to them. And that just kind of sets you apart, right? You're looking, we always talk, Jonathan, about 1% better, right? The aggregation of marginal gains. If someone goes out of their way to remember your name, you're going to probably then go out of your way to get to know them or find out who they are or just talk to them, be nice to them. Like all these things, it sounds like little things, but the little things are the big things in life. They really are. So just look for this. And when I'm on a phone call, the customer service representative always says their name first. I, on my PC here, I have a notepad. I open up notepad before every phone call. And as soon as they say their name, I type it down. It's as simple as that. And this is part of my notes. I write down the date and time 
and their their name. So then I can use their name a couple of times. So I, Jonathan, I'm sure you can think of many times that that you've saved money. I can think of a couple just in the last maybe year or so. I just by being nice, by being pleasant, by doing these things that we're talking about. I my daughters had a dental visit. Evidently, we weren't aware that they didn't get x-rays twice a year or something, you know, something like that. And we got billed like 80 bucks for these things. And I wound up calling up and just being really pleasant and nice to the person in their billing office. And she's like, you know what? You guys have a great history. Of, you've been a, a patient for a long time. I'm going to waive it for you. And I mean, that was 80 times two. That was $160 right there, right? This is a financial independence show. We're talking about the strategies that help you succeed, but, but there are real dollars attached to this. Don't, don't lose sight of that. I recently had a call with Verizon where I was able to to negotiate something and and get like a I think it was a twelve dollar charge off my bill each month to essentially get the same service. And again, it was just doing what Refined by Fire said, taking notes. I had to make two phone calls, which was kind of annoying for a twelve dollar a month savings. But still, that's something I'm willing to do. Right. That's twelve dollars a month that I do not have anymore because of two short phone calls and following these strategies. So yeah, I mean, I know that it works. It's not just the big things like medical bills, but I mean, clearly, man, if you can get tens of thousands of dollars off your medical bills just by doing this, that's a huge win. And you know, Brad, one of the things that I wanted to to highlight was this idea of the position of strength, right? I mean, in this case, we're talking about cleaning up medical debt, but negotiation and these type of tactics are something that will carry you long after the fact you know, when you're dealing with cleaning up medical debt and really into every aspect of your life as you end up inevitably purchasing stuff. Right. And, and I was thinking about this a lot because one of the things that I realized, one of the things that has saved us a ton of money over the years is frankly, that we have not gone into furniture stores. So my wife and I have been married for five years now, and we've been in this home that we're in now since the beginning of like 2012. I'm sure we got some furniture, but we do not regularly go into furniture stores. And why, And I'm sure that when many of us think about negotiating, one, I don't think about negotiating at Walmart. I don't think about negotiating at Best Buy. But one of the obvious, there's two places that come to mind when you're really talking about negotiating at retail, and that is on most car lots and at a furniture store. Those are high margin environments. Usually there's a lot of sales built into that. And you assume that if you don't negotiate, you're getting, uh, you're not going to get as good of a deal. Now there's two points I wanted to make. One is that just by the virtue of the fact that we don't go into furniture stores very often, we don't go into car lots very often, if ever, we have not been exposed to all the amazing stuff that we don't have. Right? Like, I mean, just think about that. That's actually worth pointing out. If you spend time in these sorts of environments, you are going to inevitably expose to items that cost 500 to $2,000 that are way better than everything that you have now. And you will feel that HGTV pull to upgrade your environment. It's just inevitable. The other half of that is we did actually go to a furniture store very recently to look for a bed for my son. Uh, He's moving out of the crib and going to be moving into the bed. And we just decided, well, let's just see what's out there. And one of the things I was reminded of is how creative financing is is laid everywhere. As soon as you walk in the door, there's signage for how you don't need to do any payments for the first amount or you don't need to have any particular credit. If you're in the position that you do not need to rely on creative financing, you do not need to rely on 0% introductory interest rates for the first 20 weeks or whatever, whatever that number looks like, you automatically are in a position of strength because you could get this at the retail price anytime, anywhere. You don't need someone to do you a favor and approve you for your you know, approve your credit score or lack thereof to get this, which means that you can just by virtue of having that can politely ask for a better price because otherwise you need to check with your wife. Otherwise you need to think about it. And, and everybody knows that if you can purchase this, you know, at any point in time, what is the incentive to purchase it now? And I became acutely aware of that as I walked out of the store without buying anything, I could just, you can just come back. There's no pressure. What is the rush for you to get this? You can always ask for a better deal. And it's much easier to do that when the conversation is, is there a way that we can approve me for payments? Because I can't afford to do all of this today. Is there a way that we can spread these payments out or whatever? When you don't need to have that conversation, then you can focus on the price. And that's a very powerful place to be in. Yeah. And that actually reminds me of a quote, if you don't mind me reading from this past Monday episode and Refined by Fire was asking, what's their incentive? I can wait theoretically, but if you want the sale or commission now, we can close this. When you approach a conversation as you're walking up to somebody, you're putting your arm around their shoulder and saying, all right, friend, here's the problem. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what I'm looking to achieve. Here's what's in it for you. Do you think we can solve this problem? 
And when it's a we can solve this problem together, you just brought them into your problem and they're more willing to help you when they become invited in rather than you're forcing angry commands at someone. That's kind of a sidebar, but it's about, like you said, Jonathan, so many people walk into these places, they just hem and haw and they don't actually pull the trigger. I mean, think about that salesperson, how much time they've spent with people who they thought were going to close a the sale, they were going to get this commission, and then they just walk away, right? Or like you said, I've got to talk to my husband, I've got to talk to my wife about this, and they never come back. Whereas people like us in the FI community who have assets, who are making decisions based on value, that's the key here. When you're making a decision based on value and you have some flexibility and you have assets, well, you're the dream customer. And I think about this, I, I may have mentioned this, Jonathan, probably like 150 episodes ago, but this is like, <laughs> it's amazing to dream. actually say that out loud that we have, we can say, <laughs> if you just go back 150 episodes, <laughs> you'll be able to hear this little pearl of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is like my dream. So in our new house, we have older HVAC systems, and I know that I'm going to need to get them replaced at some point, probably in the next couple of years. So my dream scenario, and, and frankly, I don't know if I have the guts to do this, but is to get a bunch of quotes and then basically write back to them and say, all right, here's your price at any day in the next 365. If you will close this for 10% less than what you just offered me, I will do it on the spot at any given moment and just put the ball in their court. If they're having a bad month, if who knows, they have contractors sitting around doing nothing and they just want to keep them busy or whatever it may be, right? Like they need some number to, to hit a quota. They remember me with this kind of oddball email that, all right, let's do it. And I can pay in cash that day or with a check or whatever it may be. And there's no financing. There's no nothing. This is guaranteed sale. But I need X percent. And who knows? It might be. You're going to get an HVAC 10. contractor messaging you like on Friday after this episode goes <laughs> live saying, hey, uh, next week, I actually have the perfect day for this. <laughs> right. But isn't that it? Right. There's downtime. I think that could work. I really do. And aside from my kind of dopey little example here, where else can you take advantage of that position of strength? I would love for people out there in the audience. Undoubtedly, many of you out there in the audience have examples of this position of strength. We'd love to hear from you. So shoot it to us on Facebook or on Twitter. I think we're doing hashtag mailbag or hopefully someone starts a thread on Facebook and we all just respond with examples of this position of strength. And yeah, we're definitely gonna read them on next week's roundup. So I'm, I'm excited to see because this is a crowdsourced show and it's a rising tide lifts all boats. My one example, this is the, the end of, of how creative, and I say that jokingly, like how creative I've been where else have other people legitimately been creative? All right. Well, let's go ahead and bring Zach in and actually talk about some feedback from the community now. Zach, what do you got for us today, man? All right. Speaking of old episodes, we got a mailbag question from at Africa Fire on Twitter. He asks, if you were to look back to your first episode, what one thing would you have done differently? This is an awesome question. I spent a little bit of time actually thinking about this. So we are now 200 plus episodes in. And if you look back at our very, very first episode, I like genuinely am happy with that episode, but I realize that that episode, like the show has gone in a different direction. So I'm really interested in bringing Brad's feedback on this, but I'm going to say one, you do not need to wait for it to be perfect. So like right now, 200 episodes in, I feel like we could do an awesome first episode, right? But you don't get to episode 200 until you've done episode one. You got you to start. You got to take that first step. So don't be afraid to essentially record that episode, release it out into the universe, continue to get better at, at anything. We're talking about podcasting, but to get better at anything and then refine your message. If you look at, at our show, we very much had this moment where we say, I think we want to take another stab at our first episode and we made it our episode 100. And honestly, like if I could... I would go back and make episode 100, episode one. And I guess physically I, we could do that. It is possible to do that, but I, I like having that episode one almost for posterity at this point. Uh, but you don't need to have your messaging perfect. You can get started and then learn along the way. And then you always have the ability or license to refine and hone your message as you get better at it. Brad, anything additional you would add to that? Yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to say. I mean, clearly Jonathan, you and I listened back to the first 10 or 15 episodes, and we kind of cringe a little bit, right? But that's with our ears today. 
having gone through 200 plus episodes. But I mean, in, in all honesty, they're pretty good episodes. So it's not like I'm, I'm embarrassed by them. But the beauty of this is the community has been with us as we've grown. You and I originally, I think on episode one, we thought this was going to be experiments in financial independence. That was kind of how we build this, that, that this was going to be you and I coming up with all these random experiments and we were going to follow through with them and be case studies. And I think that's still a pretty cool idea, but, but clearly that's not where we went with this. And we didn't know that on day one, but it didn't stop us. Right. Jonathan, to your point, like it wasn't perfect. And yeah, I mean, is that going back to episode one and listening to it now? Like, is that where we went with the subsequent episodes? No, we're not going to delete the episode because that was where we were at that moment in time. Just like when I said, you know, all the time or, um, or, ah, like you, you don't realize what you say until you record it and then listen to yourself for hundreds of hours. You find out your little eccentricities really quickly. But am I embarrassed by that? No, I was an accountant sitting in a room in Richmond, Virginia, trying to figure this out. And like, I think there's value in that, in people seeing that, that we're growing as people and that we've had these ideas along the way. Jonathan, the Friday Roundup, I would say that's one of the most important things we've done. And we had no idea when we started that we were going to do a Friday Roundup. Now, naturally, it happened fairly quickly within, I guess, the first couple of months. But I had no clue. And I think maybe the idea, I listened to that Impact Theory podcast and they actually had a show called After Impact. So they had an interview with a guest and then they kind of had this After Impact episode. And that may have been kind of where I came up with that. But but who the heck knows? But regardless, it's us learning and learning what's going to work. And I think the Friday Roundup at this point is as important as the Monday episode, if not more important to me. I, I really love these roundups. So I think you learn along the way and the local groups, the Facebook group, like none of this stuff existed at the beginning. But as we realized the power of community, I think you and I didn't understand the power of community on day one quite as much as we do now. We knew it was there, but we had no idea the yearning that people had to connect with other people in the Phi community. And yeah, had we known that would have been day one, but is it a missed opportunity? No, because we grew the podcast and then we grew the community almost in tandem. And that's kind of a long way of saying, like, I'm very pleased with the arc of this, but clearly there were things that we didn't know on day one that we know now, but I wouldn't go back and change it. And while this kind of question is a self-contained question, I think probably we will maybe do biggest lessons learned as an episode at some point this year, probably later on in the year, if that's something that our audience would be interested in. All right, Zach, what else you got for us? All right. So we got a question from Justin on the Facebook group. He says, I'm looking to decide on a new career path. My goal is to obviously find something I can enjoy and offers the freedom to work my own schedule or remotely. I plan on getting an online degree for this, and I want to get something that's worth my time as I'm about to turn 28. I've currently had a decent paying job as a security contractor for DHS, but this is absolutely not a career nor fulfilling to me. My first thoughts were a finance degree, computer science, or math degree. I don't know the first thing about coding, but I love problem solving. I was hoping for some feedback on, first, a good major that is versatile, and second, potential careers that offer a lot of freedom, are fulfilling, and have the ability to travel. Cool. So obviously this is wide open, but I think like just using some of the things that have come up on the show over the past maybe six months, we could maybe fill in some gaps. And please don't assume that this is all that's out there, but I think it's relevant just because this is what our community has been talking about lately. So Brad, how about I start with just a couple that are on my radar and then you can, we'll kind of go back and forth on this. Sounds good. All right. So one, uh, we had a really cool mention about air traffic controllers. You need to be below the age of 31 in order to get accepted. It's a six month schooling process. There is a huge shortage of air traffic controllers in the United States right now. And once you get through this six month to one year program, which you're making money the entire time, you can make up to and around $150,000 a year. This is just a very, very interesting profession to take a look at. Uh, we've obviously talked about trade schools and how powerful that can be. Coding, you mentioned coding. Coding is one that's pretty impressive because you can take essentially a six month boot camp. And, and I don't, I want to stress that like coding is not easy. You know, this isn't just something that anybody can do. But with Ryan Carson from episode 74, he said one of the biggest things is grit. You know, can you grind it out? Can you stay focused on this? Can you 
with, with the tools available, can you put the focus in to learn this new school? It's definitely possible with coding. You can do a six month to nine month boot camp and start out making $50,000 a year. And as soon as you become a mid to experienced coder, you're making anywhere from 90,000 and beyond. I mean, I know on the, on the West coast, you can make upwards of 150 to 240. I mean, it's just absurd. There's almost no limit on what you can make as a coder, especially on the West coast. So those are three that come to mind and I have some more, but Brad, anything else stand out to you? Yeah, Jonathan. I mean, we've heard some people like Grant Sabatier mention that he picked up skills through Google. There was some course that he learned in like under 30 days. And I think they have a a ton of different things available, but you can learn Google AdWords or Google AdSense. And I mean, those are significant skills that would make you very, very attractive to people in all sorts of different companies. If you came in and said, hey, I can optimize your Google AdWords campaigns and you get more customers for less money. Who's going to say no to that? So if that's a skill that you could learn basically for free online through Google, how would you not do that? That to me is a huge, huge win. I mean, I think, Jonathan, you can probably talk about a lot of other digital type things like web designers or people who can create pictures and images to go on sites. Those are very valuable resources that a lot of websites want desperately, but they just can't find somebody. So I suspect there are lots and lots of things like that. If I can, before I throw it back to you, Jonathan, I want to talk about accounting. You asked about what is a great major. Now I have kind of talked in the background here about how I didn't love my profession as I was in tax accounting and I I didn't especially love the tax side. But if you're asking me for what is a valuable major, the answer to me is accounting. It is the backbone and the language of business. And I know Jonathan, just in our own, just kind of running our books and running things like this for, for choose a five, you know, this is a business. I mean, me having this accounting background has helped significantly and has saved us a lot of money because we don't have to hire somebody to do that. I think it also enables you when you're creating a business and forget about a podcast or website, but just a real, a real business, if you will having that background in accounting enables you to think differently. And it looks at a problem slightly differently as opposed to just so many people say these, these just random off the wall things that just to me show they, they just don't understand business. Like, oh, they must make a million dollars. And and we're talking about gross revenue. Whereas, okay, if they have a million dollars in gross revenue, but their expenses are a million, 100,000, is that a successful business? No, a business that makes $50,000 in revenue that comes in and only has a couple thousand in expenses is much, much more valuable, right? That's a better business because there's profit there. And I'm getting off on a tangent, obviously, but even something as fundamental as that, you'd be so surprised at how people just don't understand it. They don't understand the rudimentary aspects of taxation. It's very difficult to have an intelligent conversation about business without understanding these things. So I would make the case that accounting is a, is a pretty valuable major. And honestly, Brad, this is the value of being in a group, a Facebook group like Choose FI is that there are so many people in so many different professions that can give you the inside track on what professions are currently blowing up, what's in high demand and what are the average wages, being able to get that pay transparency and just know what is the expected range for a profession that maybe you had never heard of. And then what is the path to get that? That's not something that you will be able to find out if you're the only information you're getting is from your immediate social circle. Uh, And so Roger back just a little bit earlier this past year had a question, what is the best trade job? Just wanting to hear different opinions. There are over 150 different comments with suggestions on all different sorts of trade jobs that start over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, that is truly incredible. John just this past week said he finished episode 117 and wanted to share that high earnings are definitely possible without a bachelor's degree. He has a two-year associate's degree, and he made over $200,000 last year. He's been at his job for some time, but there are those coming straight from school that are making under 100K and around 150 after three to five years, and he works as a chemical plant operations supervisor. Kyle points out that wind turbine technician is the fastest growing sector in the nation currently. So there are jobs that you have not heard of and there are a bunch more, you know, I'm just for the sake of time, I'm just compressing a few in here. We'll link to these threads on the show notes so that you can actually find out more if you're looking for a new path, but don't feel limited. If all you're reading is, you know, the doom and gloom, 
then you're going to feel like your options are really limited. If you get outside of that immediate social circle and you're willing to do some networking, which basically just looks like being a part of the Facebook group and following up on threads that you find interesting, there are many, many options out there to find at bare minimum above an immediate income salary. But really, honestly, the door is open. If you're willing to relocate, if you're willing to look in a different area or different environment, there are all sorts of opportunities that are out there. We've also talked about Salesforce on episode 117. Bradley was sharing with us how you could use Salesforce to get a job that makes upwards of 70,000. Uh, someone was talking about Google Analytics recently, how that kind of tied to what you were talking about earlier, how that's incredibly high demand. We were talking about nursing, how that is one of the most in-demand careers in the country and all over the country. You're making an above median income. If you go out to the West Coast, you, in some cases, you're making over $200,000, which I still have trouble wrapping my mind around. So this is a question really becomes a question of what do you want to do? And what sort of changes are you willing to make to realize this reality? And Jonathan, this is probably a great time to give a shout out to Didier on the group. Oh, yeah. This was probably one of the most encouraging posts of the week. And Didier said, not a lot of people in my life I can share this with and have them understand. I found out about financial independence in August of 2018 with no emergency fund, let alone retirement funds put away. Today, I'm proud to say that with a healthy emergency fund, I just bought my first share of VTSEX using my first ever Roth IRA account. The fire is spreading, my friends. Brad, this is incredible. <laughs> That's awesome. I love to read these. Just love it. Congrats, Didier. That's fantastic. And you know, and tied to that, the other post, man, that just lit me up, Bill was talking about, he's been talking about getting your spouse on board, right? His wife has been just a little bit resistant to this. And he says, I'm working to get buy-in for what the FI community does. I finally got my wife to listen to half a podcast. I chose Misadventure Rich. Watching my wife's expression was hilarious as Jonathan would ask a question about a common misconception. It was like he was asking exactly what my wife was thinking couldn't work. And each time, each time, Misadventure Rich would answer in the most disarming way. My wife's face would soften <laughs> just a little <laughs> more. <laughs> Once I saw her jaw drop at just how radically different and wonderful it sounded. She doesn't buy it completely yet, but the walls are coming down. I signed her email up for Mrs. Frugalwood's 30 day challenge tonight. She says she's been reading them and like some of her ideas. I haven't even read them myself. I also tonight mentioned the kid who applied for all the scholarships and went to college for $5,000 a year. She was very interested in that. Keep up the good work. Brad, let me actually just like come behind the scenes here. For my wife, it was actually Mrs. Frugalwood's email list as well. That was a massive, a massive thing for her was just seeing this incredibly relatable person share her kind of best homesteading practices. And to this day, my wife is a huge fan of buy nothing groups, both giving away stuff that we're not using and getting other stuff for our son, largely due to that episode and Mrs. Frugalwood's content that she's been producing. It had a massive impact on my family's journey to financial independence. Yeah, Liz is just a wonderful ambassador for FI. She's actually going to be at FinCon this year. So hopefully Danny will uh, join us at least for a day. I think Laura might be coming up to FinCon for a day. So yeah, I know Laura is actually eagerly anticipating meeting Liz. So yeah, it's it's cool. And it's been neat to see Danny jump into those buy nothing groups. I know that's become a huge part of her life. I mean, think about this. So when Liz would talk in that episode, that more recent episode that we did, she was basically saying, you know, we want a play castle for my child instead of going out and buying it new. I just wait to see if something and sure enough, the universe responds and we end up paying nothing for it. And she was making multiple points that, you know, just by virtue of repurposing something, she not only is not spending the money, but she's keeping something out of a landfill. Keeping stuff out of a landfill has increasingly been like something that I think about as well. And I have other stories related to that. But I want to say that with our son, we have seen this over and over again. And it's not by accident. It's a fact that my wife is in a group that is looking to repurpose and reuse items that their children can't use. And this is obvious. Like Brad, you gave us that little push car. I haven't actually given you feedback on this. It's my son's favorite toy. It goes around our driveway. We push him around in it. He absolutely loves it. That is something that in a different life, maybe that in just ends up in a landfill or ends up unused for years and years and years. Like it is, it's perfect utilization. It's bringing so much joy to my son's life. And a year or two from now, he's not going to be able to use it. And assuming it's still in workable conditions, someone else will get some use out of it. It's the same thing with us. We have other items that he's kind of aged through. And as soon as we no longer need, we're looking to give that to another family so their child can benefit from from it for that, you know, one month to one year period of time that they're actually in that age range. It's, it's just obvious once you see it and the money that you save is incredible. Yeah. And Jonathan, actually, while you were talking, this reminded me, we, we have an example of this in our life just from this past week. I can't believe I forgot this, but 
our friends, Elizabeth and Matt, who actually listen to the podcast and they, they live right around the corner. Elizabeth, I guess, was getting ready to donate some of her old clothes. And she actually shot Laura a text and said, hey, I've got these, these great clothes. I'm pretty sure they're in your size. Do you want to take a look at them before I give them away? That was just like a really cool thing. And she said, like, I feel a little weird asking this. And, and Laura's like, don't feel weird. That's so incredibly kind. And, and yeah, I mean, if you can reuse things and not have to buy new things, that's phenomenal. And eventually when Laura does stop wearing it, of course, she'll donate it to charity. So this is that chain of buying nothing. And it's really, really cool. And again, once you see it, it's obvious. And with us putting all of this time into how can we help foster and build communities around the country and around the world, maybe this there's another aspect to this that we could actually incorporate in the, in the communities instead of creating a marketplace, which is valuable, you know, in and of itself. But it's not exactly our focus. Our focus is building community. And I tell you, there is nothing that fosters community more than when you have something that you're no longer using, that you love, but you're no longer using, being able to find another home for it, for someone that can use it and maybe a year or two or a few steps behind you. And, and this is just such an obvious choice with how to actually pursue that. And I'm seeing some of our local groups actually take this on. And if they have examples of how that's actually already happening in these local areas, let us know. We'd love to share it with the larger Chooseify audience. And if you want to find a local group near you, the easiest way to do that is just go to choosefi.com slash local. There are well over 200 local groups all around the world at this point, and hopefully there will be one near you. If you don't see one in your area and you want to start one, just send us an email to feedback at choosefi.com, uh, letting us know what part of the world you're in, and we will do our best to help facilitate that. Speaking of local groups, just wanted to remind everybody, especially in the D.C., Maryland, Northern Virginia area, that the Choose FI Junior Achievement Meetup is in April. Yes. Now, this is a very exciting one. So Brad and I are actually going to be traveling to that area to do that particular meetup. There's 30 spots at this event. I think there's still just a few spots available if you want to join us. We're going to be going to this Junior Achievement Finance Park. If you are in that area and you want to volunteer, there will be a link to the event in the show notes. Please sign up soon. The date of the event is April 8th. It's going to go from 8.30 in the morning or 8.20 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. We're going to be working with kids, teaching them about basic economics. It's a very, very cool environment. And we'll probably do just a small meetup at the end uh, just to kind of you know spend some time together as we all have time. All the details are in the DC Metro group and there will be a link to the event in the show notes for today's episode in our Frederick, Maryland group, Rob, uh, inspired by Vicki Robbins, money talk cards is going to be posting one question a week in his local group. You know, this is a really cool way to spur discussions and get to know each other in on March 19th, the Nebraska group and the Mr. Money mustache group are going to have a combined meetup to discuss financial independence at Barrett's pub and grill in Omaha, Nebraska. Wow. Barrett's pub. I like it. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> choiced. <laughs> And yeah, I actually got to meet a lot of those folks last year when I went out for the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. So that's a great group out there in Omaha. And yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the list here. Northern New Jersey is having a meeting on the 21st, Gainesville, Florida on the 23rd, Dallas on the 23rd, Colorado Springs also on the 23rd, Means having their first meeting in Portland, and Buffalo had their first meetup on the 24th of March. Actually, Jonathan, we now have a group, a Chooseify Stanford, and they set up a hike for the 24th as well. It looks like San Diego, Baltimore, San Antonio, Sacramento, Connecticut, and Fresno are all having meetings at the end of this month. So lots and lots going on. This is actually really interesting. I, the Choose If I Stanford group is the first group that we have that is now attached to an actual college location. And that was a very interesting idea. What if these concepts actually did percolate into the college environment? That is something that if I, if, you know, going to Virginia Tech, if I had known that there was a financial independence group at Virginia Tech, I would have been 100% on board. What does that look like for career hacking, planning your first steps? I mean, there's a lot of opportunities if you're finding about this information in college. So, I was very, very excited to see the Chooseify Stanford group join us and very excited to see kind of going into the future what that might actually mean, because that, that is a really, really cool concept. Yeah, this is a big deal. We were really pleasantly surprised when the, the Stanford Financial Independence Group came to us and, and wanted to come under the banner of Chooseify. And I think this can spread far and wide to many, many other colleges. I mean, we talk about how do you get people into this community? How do you get them aware I mean, me going to Stanford or Virginia Tech or the University of Richmond or wherever it may be and giving a speech, yeah, that may work. But if you have recent alumni or you have other people who are current students as part of this group, 
it's that relatability, right? It's that story that we're always talking about. You see yourself in that person because they just went through what you did four years at this university. So I love this idea and we want this to spread. So if you're interested in setting up a group for your university, whether you're an alumni or a current student, send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com and we're going to make this happen. So we'd love to see dozens, if not hundreds of these pop up all across the country. Uh, just a few other things. In April, Raleigh's hosting a meeting with Bonnie Truex, who is our guest on episode 115. And then Chicago, uh, they're doing a really awesome meetup focused on investing basics, diving deep into the technical aspects of pursuing FI. It's going to have a large venue with side discussions. If anybody wants to talk about passion projects, swap FI stories, or commiserate on pre or post fire life. New Facebook groups in Barcelona, Santa Cruz, and Western Slope, Colorado. So the fire is continuing to spread. Brad, I think we have a couple community member shout outs this week as well. Yeah, Jonathan, we got an amazing one from Brittany in the Facebook group. And she said, I just want to say how happy I am to have found this community almost by accident. I am now about 10 episodes into the podcast. I've lived this phi oriented life for the past decade, and I didn't even know it. I've always invested in low cost ETFs, bought a home at one quarter of our budget, have managed at $1.80 per meal average for years. Wow. Avoided life. Yeah, right. That's amazing avoided lifestyle inflation and kept a savings rate of 40 to 50% minimum for years. I've done these things since making minimum wage and kept it going from there. Now I am trying to learn more about tax optimization little by little. All this to say, I've done this for a decade just because, but with no real goals in mind. Having discovered FI and the goals many of you share, I feel so inspired to rethink what I want for my future and for my family. I'm excited to be part of this group and support many of you in your journeys. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Brittany. Shira says, sorry for the long post. I'm an ecstatic mom this morning. I asked my son what project he wanted to do this summer, and he said, start his woodworking business. My son is 11, but great with power tools, and he makes some nice things. He even told me the classes and the tools he would need and how much of his allowance he needs to save. He said he only wants me and his grandma as his investors. It makes me happy because one of our family objectives is to create enough income to support a third generation. Lofty, but it was his goal. He says he wants to start the business now. So one, the money we have for him at 18, he can save. And two, the money from the business can help pay for his engineering degree. And three, he wants to leave it to his kids. That is his contribution to the family plan. Moments like this make me feel like I'm doing something right. Dude, I want to talk to her on a Friday roundup more about this. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, that's more than something, right? That's everything, right? That's incredible stuff. I mean, to have those kind of goals, that's absurd. That is what second generation FI is all about. And wow, thank you so much for sharing with us. All right. Now, unfortunately, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. And there's three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book from Vincent Puglisi, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review. And then send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get. And we announce the winner on the Friday roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today. And Patrick left this on Stitcher and said, this podcast will psych you up. Chooseify has a lot of great information for beginners, but as someone who is already house hacking, living frugally, and trying to become the millionaire next door, this show has helped me take my financial independence pursuit to the next level. These guys bring it every episode. For example, I was already investing, but Brad and Jonathan encouraged my wife and I to invest more with their millionaire educator episode teaching us that my wife could contribute not only to her already maxed out 457, but also to her 403B account. I was already using travel rewards, but these guys pushed me to get those extra free miles. When your mind goes in circles after reading a 100-page Boglehead thread, try listening to these guys break things down with bite-sized, actionable tips that actually make you move forward in your path to FI. Also a bonus that these guys are out of Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Keeping it local. <laughs> All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.